Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Veronica and I am the Vice President of White Hat and today I'm gonna to be giving a talk on privacy. Uh, so I'm just gonna be going over what is privacy? Why do we care about it? Uh, some ways to uh, enact privacy, some ways that our privacy is entroached on and how you as an individual can be more private. And I'll just review everything at the end. So what, what is privacy? You probably already have kind of a sense of what privacy is since you're here at this talk. Um, but something that's normally confused is the difference between privacy and security. I've heard it used interchangeably before and they're pretty different. So I'm just gonna highlight some of those differences. So privacy is essentially the right to be left alone. Um, and this goes over kind of how much control over a person has over their own data and who knows that information um, and how much data they give. Now security on the other hand is how is that data protected? Now you could think of privacy and security with this analogy. Privacy would be like this cardboard house on the left where you can't really see inside the house. The windows are fake, the doors don't open, but if you really wanted to steal something from it, you could probably just punch a hole in the wall and take whatever you want from inside. On the other hand, security would be like this super thick, state-of-the-art secure glass house, <laughs> which no one can steal anything from it. It's super secure, super thick glass, can't break it, um, but anyone can see inside of it, so it's not private at all. So hopefully now that we have, um, or hopefully we now have a better sense of what privacy is. Now, why, why do we want it? I'm just gonna have a little thought experiment here. Just remember, try to remember what the last thing you searched on a search engine was. If you can think of it and you wanna share, go ahead and share it in the chat. I don't even know if I can see the chat, honestly, but if you just, if you're feeling spicy, kind of want a little bit more social interaction than normal, you could share it in the chat. For me, it was probably like, thank you, Jif. Now, thank you, Jif, probably doesn't say that much about me, actually. It's just like one isolated incident. Maybe I'm giving a presentation and I wanna put a funky Jif at the end, spoiler alert. Um, but probably doesn't say that much. Uh, question, are there, how do I see chat? Oh, there's chat, let's see. <laughs> R slash MLB streams, yeah. So <laughs> what is the B-movie script? Yes, <laughs> these are, um, if you look at these Google searches on their own, or not Google necessarily, search engine searches on their own, they don't say too much about these people. Okay, maybe injection and subjection proof examples might say you're like in a certain type of class, um, but like overall, not it's not too revealing. However, when you look at certain other types of searches, like for example, if you saw that someone searched corona symptoms, what might you be able to imply about this person? Just maybe, like a good guess, what might you think about this person? If someone wants to unmute and say what they think or just type in chat, feel free. <laughs> Andy says basic, probably highly possible. They said, <laughs> there's us, yep, true, true. So yeah, if someone is typing or searching corona symptoms, there's a good chance that them or someone they know might be exhibiting symptoms that they suspect could be related to corona. Um, now this might not necessarily be something that they wanna hide or not, but let's look at some other examples. Feet pics. If someone's searching for feet pics, it could imply something about them. Perhaps this person has a feet fetish <laughs> Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically, if you know that someone is searching feet pics, then you might think like, oh, they might have a feet fetish or maybe they're just looking for feet for like a presentation or something. I don't know. But this might be a search that someone might want to keep a secret um, or might want it to be private. Now, something like abortion clinics near me, this also heavily implies that someone may be pregnant or someone that they know may be pregnant and might be searching for options. Um, this again is probably something that someone would really wanna keep a secret. So hopefully these examples can show you that 
there are things that people do on the internet that people would want to keep it. Um, so I just want us to consider also, those were just individual examples of simple searches that people could do. Now think about the aggregation of every single Google search or every single Amazon purchase that you've made, or even just like every item that you've thrown out in the past month. This can say a lot about you. This idea is what we call big data, which is just the aggregation of a bunch of data. And all of this put together, like not even just like between the platforms, but just all of your Google searches on its own can say, or not Google necessarily if you don't use Google, but it can say a lot about who you are as a person. And maybe you're fine with whatever search engine you use knowing all of your searches, but maybe you're not. So a lot of people who have a problem, have a problem with privacy will say that they have nothing to hide. This is probably the most prominent argument against privacy um, that people use. And in all fairness, like sure, there are a lot of things that like people will generally say like, oh, like I'm fine with sharing this. And that's great, but sometimes like, is it really nothing that you wanna hide? Like nothing at all? Like, just think about it. <laughs> And if you really think like, oh, no, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm totally open. Like the government can know anything about me. Like, okay, sure. Maybe, maybe you really are fine with the government knowing everything about you. But even just like, are you fine with your parents knowing everything that you do? Is there even like some information that you wouldn't want everyone to know? Just like, you know, just something to think about. And even if you still think that like, you are completely an open book, what if suddenly you did have something that you wanted to hide? Or maybe you were someone that like, um, for example, if you lived in a foreign country and you were queer, but that country that you lived in, it was like a crime. Shouldn't at least those people have the ability to keep their, the fact that they downloaded Grindr like a secret? So for these reasons, hopefully you can understand why privacy might be important. So now that we're hopefully on the same page that privacy is necessary, how do we as computer scientists and security enthusiasts implement privacy for everybody? Well, I'm going to tell y'all about something called K-anonymity. So to explain this, I'm gonna have to just go over some basics here. Um, so organizations are going to have to collect and keep our data and many will actually need these for legitimate purposes, um, even if it is personally identifying information. So how can they keep our identity secret while still catering to our specific needs or using our information to, for research, for example? So we're gonna consider um, this hospital database. Uh, you can see that there are four columns here, name, gender, age, disease. Now, the first three, name, gender, and age, are gonna be what we call quasi-identifiers because these can be used to uh, or to identify these people like along with other sources as well. So if you were to find some sources online with similar data, maybe you also saw a Tammy who is female and 63, you might be able to guess that these are the same people. So these are cause identifiers because they can use, be used to identify these people. Um, now the sensitive attribute is, <laughs> the sensitive attribute is the disease because these people probably want to keep their diseases a secret. And don't worry, Aaron, totally fake data. <laughs> Completely made it up. Um, yeah, so the disease they'd want to keep a secret. So it's called the sensitive attribute. Now, K anonymity would mean that there need to be at least K individuals in the data set who share the set of attributes that might become identifying for each individual. That's a lot of words. Like, even when I'm trying to like think that over in my mind, it doesn't totally make sense. So I'm gonna try to show you guys an example. We're gonna k-anonymize this data set. Um, so k to k-anonymize something, we use two techniques, or we can use up to two techniques, generalization and suppression. So let's say, just to make it a little easier to understand, let's say that you know Sally, Sally is your neighbor. You know that Sally is a female, you know that her name is Sally, and you know that she is 20 years old, but you don't know that she has cancer and she doesn't want you to know that she has cancer. Um, 
So because we have the names here and names are completely unique in this database, I'm just gonna choose to suppress that. You don't need their name. It doesn't really help you for any research. Well, not you, but like researchers who would want this data, they don't need to know the names. Um, it just identifies the person. It doesn't help them. So we will suppress that, which means we're just gonna entirely get rid of it. Next, age can still be pretty helpful. If we're only left with gender and disease, sure, you can get um, some sort of trends of what genders get which diseases, but it's not that helpful. So we're gonna try to give the researchers a little bit more to work with. We're gonna try to give them an age range, but not like a specific age. So this is what we would call um, generalizing the data. Oh, earlier was suppressing the data. And this is generaliz generalizing. So now there are only three different categories that a person's age can be in. So now, you might know that Sally is a female and that she was, I believe she was 20. <laughs> but as you can see, there are two females who are under 30 here now. So you don't know if, so even if you knew that Sally went to this specific clinic, so she would have to be in this database, you don't know if she's perfectly healthy or if she has cancer. So this is what we're left with. Now that you can see this, um, remember what, K was, at least K individuals in the data set who share the set attributes. So in this data set, we can see, or we're gonna try to find what the K value is here, first off. Um, so for females over 60, there are two who identify with this. You could see that in the green. Um, for males between the ages of 31 and 60, there are also two who have this identifier or this set of identifiers. And then for females under 31 or females under 30, there are also two. So the minimum of two, two and two is two. That gives us a K value of two. <laughs> so hopefully that makes it a little bit clearer to understand. Um, but I, I have a question for y'all just Looking at this table, is what's wrong with this table? Can anyone see anything kind of weird? Something that's like, is this person really protected? Uh, is, it, is their privacy violated? Is it that the, uh, the females over 61 both have respiratory disease? Exactly, yes. Thank you, Henry. Um, so yeah, if you can see in this database, even though there's two different uh, sets of identifiers, for the female over 60 or 61 years old, both of them have respiratory disease. So if you happen to know Tammy and that she was a female over 61 and that she went to this clinic, even though she could be either the first one or the second one listed, either way, she's gonna have a respiratory disease. So it doesn't really protect her privacy. Um, because of this, or er, this is where diversity and T closeness come in. However, I'm not going to get too far into that in this talk. Um, so I just want you to know that K anonymity on its own does have its limits. And there are further tools to better protect uh, people. So good job on finding that. Um, and just know that there's more to it. So now just on to the next section, web tracking. It happens. So I'm just gonna show you guys a website um, that shows you a lot about what uh, different browsers can see, share. Okay, hopefully you can see a big green button here that says button. Awesome. So if I click this button, it tells me that I clicked the button. In fact, if I just start doing other stuff on the screen, actually, let's, let's clear it first. I was playing around with this too much earlier today. There we go. Reset. Okay. So if I click the button. Subject entered website. It hmm. knows what Let's I've see. done. <laughs> Firefox. Concerned about privacy. Drag this button. Educated. Alternative. And I can see just like where my mouse Unusual is, what behavior. I click on. Hmm. Just things about my computer as well. No, really? 
But it's also very sassy if you can hear Moving it. Moving um, around a lot now. Curious I'm and energetic. Out of that. So, yeah, it just kind of gives you a little bit of a quick view of what um, websites can see when you visit them. So just a bit more about that. That was just kind of a really quick little fun example. Um, now, what can they actually really see? Just when you first enter a website, they already get your computer's configuration. So they can immediately see your user agent string, um, what time zone you're in, what plugins you have, like what fonts are downloaded to your computer, stuff like that. Um, and now, I uh, Panopticlick. And it's a really fun, not really fun. It's, it's a cool website. Panopticlick is a research project to uncover tracking techniques of online trackers. So this is going to look at my specific configuration and tell me how unique I am um, based off what I have. If you guys want to do it too, you can Google Panopticlick or whatever search engine you want to use. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm going to, oops, we're not there yet. I'm going to share my panoptic click with y'all. OK, so now if you guys also did this, you'll see this screen. Um, and you can click this button that says test me. So then it's going to receive the information from my computer and tell me what it sees. So immediately, or it just tells me that, yes, I have some sort of ad blocking. Um, I'm using Firefox right now, so my router is partially bleh, blocking invisible trackers, um, stuff like this. And also, the does your browser unblock third parties that promise to honor do not track? No, I'm not. Um, I'm going to go into this a little bit later. Uh, so from here, you could see full results. And it shows you exactly what. Um, I mentioned earlier how it can see my user agent, my time zone, my system fonts, stuff like this. And it even tells you um, for each thing, how unique are you? So one in 20.46 people have my same system fonts. So in all of this combined, I have the uniqueness of one in around 100,000 browsers have the same fingerprint as me. I'd say compared to some of you, I'm guessing that my number is probably a little bit less unique just because I haven't played around on this computer too much. So I haven't really personalized it as much. But if you guys got cool numbers, you could share it in chat if you want, if you also did this. Um, sorry, I'm resizing the window a lot. I'm sure that's kind of annoying for you guys. But yeah, just a fun little tool so you could see how unique you are. Um, so when you visit a website, and you have this super unique fingerprint, this combination of things, and you leave the website, even if you didn't accept any cookies, even if you didn't log in or anything like that, if you visit it again, it'll see your same combination of user agent, system fonts, et cetera. And it can probably tell, hey, this is probably the same person who was here earlier. Uh, just a thing to note in case you want to do something about it. Um, so I mentioned do not track. Just well, what, what is that? <laughs> Let me tell you. Well, it's basically, it was designed your browser telling whatever website you're visiting, hey, can you not track me? But then whatever you're trying to connect to or whatever website you're going to can either be like, oh yeah, sure. I won't do that if you don't want me to. Or it could be like, mm, no, I'm just going to track you. So like, there's no way to enforce it, really. It's just a polite way of saying, like, hey, I'd rather not be tracked. But there's not really much they can do. And in fact, they end up seeing that you asked to not be tracked. And then in turn, it makes you more trackable, because very few people ask to not be tracked, which is why I don't have it enabled. But if you choose that it's something that you would like, <laughs> then the way to enable it would be, um, at least for Firefox, you just go into your options, click on privacy and security, and it's just here. You could hit allow or always if you want or whatever. Yeah. So now 
You saw, you're super unique. You don't like that. What are you gonna do about it? This is what you're gonna do about it. You can do three different things in terms of web site because they're a resource. resource. Um, you could use Tor Browser. Now, this works to standardize many different um, identifiers that I mentioned before, so it makes you less unique. Um, but it does this by basically encrypting your traffic and bouncing it all over the world slowly, or it's slow. Because <laughs> you're, you're bouncing it to a lot of different places, making it really hard to find out who originally sent it. But in turn, it's taking forever. So like you can use it, but it's, it's a little unreasonable for just normal internet browsing. You can also disable JavaScript. Um, this would stop the detection of plugins or fonts. However, if you've ever programmed websites or just tried disabling JavaScript, you probably realize that a lot of what makes websites cool looking and interactive is JavaScript. So if you're disabling that, get ready to see some just kind of gross looking websites. Um, it's also necessary for some websites. So sometimes if you visit a website and you have JavaScript disabled by default, it'll be like, hey, you can't join or you can't enter this website unless you enable JavaScript. Just something to keep a note of if you do want to do that. Um, also, you could just use a common browser. Um, so if you use a common one, then you're less unique. However, say you use um, like one of the latest MacBooks and you're running like Safari. Like sure, that's pretty common, but if you think about someone using some like archaic phone to browse the internet, that archaic phone is gonna be super unique, but amongst the set of people who are using that archaic phone, there's probably like no customizability, no personalization in that, which makes it a lot less fingerprintable within that set. Whereas the new MacBook's probably gonna have a lot of personalization stuff that makes you look more unique. So it's just a trade off, something to think about. Um, now, just outside of web browsing or just general protections, um, you can review your app permissions. Just like sometimes you'll see that, um, for example, I was actually, um, this summer I was working on the user privacy team for Apple and my whole thing was that I was looking through app store permissions. And I remember I would see stuff like some solitaire apps asking for your location. It's just, sometimes you wanna double check and just see like, do these apps really need what they say they need? Um, also use HTTPS when you can. The S stands for secure. This just means that it encrypts your traffic. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be fully secure, but it's way better than just HTTP because it encrypts the traffic, which makes it more private. So any listeners won't be as easily able to decrypt or see what traffic you have. Um, you can use a VPN that you trust, a uh, keyword on that you trust, because the whole idea of a VPN is like a bodyguard for your data that takes it to its own servers. But if you don't trust that server to begin with to hold on to your data, then they could just be selling your data and defeats the purpose. Um, and lastly, Use a passcode instead of a fingerprint when traveling. I took the privacy class here at Cal Poly and that was just kind of a fun tidbit that um, I learned. So apparently when you go to the airport to TSA and you have your phone, if for whatever the reason they're like, yo, we need to look inside your phone right now. If yours is fingerprint protected, then they're able to like force you to use your finger to unlock your phone and so they could search it for whatever reason. Um, but if you use a passcode, I believe it's like considered intellectual property or something. So they're not able to touch that. Um, so it's just like a fun tidbit. If you're traveling and you want to keep your phone safe, passcode it. Yeah. That also just subtle plug. If you want more privacy, super fun class. I believe the prerequisites are just 300 and 357. So just throwing it out there if you enjoyed the talk so far, like go for it. <laughs> um, and just a quick review of things that we covered. So nothing to hide is not a valid excuse against privacy. Um, K anonymity, there's a definition again, but hopefully you remember it now. Um, also going back to my, <laughs> I, I don't wanna like flex it, but just this was the first 
um, question that I was asked on my privacy interview was just what is K anonymity? So it's if you're interested in this, might be a good thing to remember. Um, websites have many methods of tracking you. Do not track was a cute idea, but it doesn't, doesn't really work. Um, and use passcodes for planes. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs>